It's good to be back at Cross Community Church, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, about two of you are happy to pass this back. <laughs> but this morning, well, I, I, <laughs> listen, it is wonderful. My wife is actually, she's here today and she's serving in the nursery and there's a lot of feedback there. So, honey, we love you and appreciate you. Can we give the wife a hand? It's not about us and it's not about us getting applause, but uh, that lady does so much for me that she, she is, uh, I'm her ministry, believe it or not, so uh, we appreciate her. If you are new here today, it's your first time visiting Cross, we are so thankful that you're here at our church. Um, we love you, we thank you for visiting. I know we have a lot out that are traveling, it's summertime, but I am so proud that we have people that stay close to the Lord during the summer because God is just as alive during the summer as He is in the fall. Amen? Amen. 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 If you'll pray with me, and we're going to go to your favorite book of the Bible today uh, in Exodus. So let's pray. Father, we love you, and just pray right now that your blessing would be upon us. Lord, I pray that you would help me to teach and preach. I cannot do that without your help. Lord, I pray for the anointing and the presence of the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and our minds and our spirits. And Lord, I pray we will be so attentive. And Lord, also we ask to bless all the ministry going on with our kids and students right now, for that is just as important. We love you, Father. We are depending upon you. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. If you'll turn with me to the book of Exodus today, we're in commandment number 9. Everybody say number 9. It only took us 25 years to get there. But we are in Exodus 20. We'll be looking at verse 16. I want to read uh, from two different translations today. A short commandment, long sermon. Amen. <laughs> Exodus 20, 16 from the English Standard Version says this. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. If you remember a few weeks ago, uh, we titled the message, Can I Get a Witness? And we talked about how we need to go out and be witnesses for Christ. How our lives are a living witness uh, to testify about the work that Christ has done in our life. And so we're going to see something a little bit uh, from a different angle today. That when Moses received these commandments and God gave those commandments to uh, those who had been exiled from Egypt and now with the exodus, the departure, and now here we are. And it says that you shall not bear false witness against. If I say against. So, so we're supposed to be a witness for Christ, but we're not supposed to bear a false witness against our neighbor. So it says this in the Amplified Version. Uh, I, I tend to like this translation. It says, you shall not testify falsely, and then it qualifies it. It says that is to lie or withhold, or manipulate the truth against your neighbor. And then I love how it says any person. So, so for those of you who live out in the country and don't have any neighbors, that does not exclude you. <laughs> and so uh, I love to amplify because it says things like that. And, and I'm going to ask you something because I like to keep it real. I mean, no, we believe the Bible is 100% right, true. We follow it best we can. Yeah? Amen. Have you ever had anybody tell lies? on you or about you. Anybody in the room? If, and if You don't have to lift your hand, but if you kept it down, uh, that's okay. But I think we would be lying if we said that no one has ever lied, as we say in the South, on us or to us or about us. I remember a few years ago, I received a phone call. Everybody say phone call. I received a phone call from a pastor who had been a mentor to me. Uh, for, for many years, and he called me, and he said, Adam, I had to hear it out of a horse's mouth, is this what he said. He said, I heard that you quit the ministry, and you've left, and, and, and you're going to get a, another job, and you're not going to be preaching anymore, and I said, I said, I said, Pastor, man, that's, if that's happening, I didn't know about it. Like, I'm, I was, you were the first person to know that I had quit and left the ministry. I said, no, I'm still pastoring. I'm still at Cross Community. I'm still there. And for some of you, that's good news. 
But how many of you hate when somebody messes up and tells stories on you that's not true? They lie and they, they say something happened that didn't happen. When we're supposed to be a witness for Christ, we are telling them what Christ has done in our lives. When you bear a false witness against someone else, you're, you're, you're fabricating a story about another person and it hurts their, their, the, the view of their character. I mean, you know, some, sometimes when people talk bad about someone, you kind of have a preconceived idea about them. Y'all still awake this morning? I know I've been down in Florida getting my tan on, but I came back ready to preach today. And they, you meet this person and you've heard all these bad things and you've already determined how they are and who they are. And sometimes it will take months or years to figure out, you know what, what I heard about them, probably, I, I don't think it was true. And if you've ever been on that end, it's not the funniest. But why do sometimes people lie? Sometimes people want to see others fall. Everybody say fall. Sometimes it's jealousy. Sometimes we lie to protect ourselves. Come on, anybody going to be real today? No, I didn't take it. No, I didn't break it. I don't know how it broke. I was the one who borrowed your car, and I don't know anyway. You know, somebody hit the door, and I wasn't there, and I don't know. Reminds me of Tommy Boy. Anyway, there's a clip about that you do. What you do? Anyway, everybody, everybody that's a, you know born in the '80s probably. Anyway, but we lie to protect ourselves. You know, sometimes we lie because we want what others have, and so we're a little bit jealous of them, and we just kind of make things up because we want you to think badly of them. Sometimes we lie because we made bad decisions, and we try to cover them up. There are times when I know people have lied to protect another person. But sometimes, church, I think in the Christian world, everybody say Christian. We have to be very careful with this commandment. And here's why. I remember this. I made me think about this in Mark 14. I have to turn there. And I'll just tell you this. If people will lie about Jesus, I'm going to read you the verses in just a moment. Then, ladies and gentlemen, what makes you think they won't lie about his children? We are his children, by the way. Our Heavenly Father. So here's what it says in Mark 14, 54. Or probably, well, we'll start 55. It says, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony. Remember, testimony, testify, uh, witness. It says, Against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. And here's 56. If you've been sleeping, wake up at 56. Everybody say, Wake up. It says, for many bore, here it is again, from the old to the new, many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And it says, and some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, and then I kind of left it, you can follow along if you want to, and read more about that later. But in other words, because Jesus was doing his ministry, they wanted to stop him. The, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders, the religious elite, the elitists, they wanted to stop his ministry. They wanted to take him down. They came against him. They bore false witness. They made stories up against him. If you read on, read on, you'll find out that they couldn't even put a good lie together. Like They didn't really even, even make sense. But they told lies about him. They were trying to stop his success. They were trying to end his ministry. I want to share a quote with you from Mark Patterson. This is from his book, Chase the Lion. And here's what I want to share with you today. Especially for those who serve in public jobs. Say, everybody say public. Uh, as a pastor, uh, people say things about pastors all the time. And half the time, you, you have to filter it out. As a school teacher, my wife is a, is a fourth grade. Well, she's moving to a different position, but she's taught fourth grade for pretty much a decade. As as a, a person who married into a family full of coaches, uh, my wife's two brothers are coaches. Her dad is a coach. She was trying not to marry a coach, although I had a, I had a physical education degree, K-12, because I was going into coaching, and then the Lord said, you're going into ministry, which I found out it's not that much different, ladies and gentlemen. There's no... <laughs> and so she tried to run from that life, but the Lord has a way of Laughing, doesn't he, church? <laughs> <laughs> you say, I never, and boy, there you go. 
And we are in positions where sometimes people love us dearly and sometimes people can hate us just as bad. I have sat in the stands at some of the, uh, watching her, her dad coach. He, he, he retired two years ago, I think it's about two years ago. And I have listened to the people talk bad about him and how hard it is to sit there when people are very false. I'm like, he didn't make that call. That wasn't his fault. And people who don't even know what's going on on the field are saying all these things. How do you know? These Pharisees and all these people that were talking bad about Jesus, that were very false witness against him, they were standing against somebody who was trying to pay the penalty for their sins and set them free. Because sometimes people throw stones at us and sometimes people lie about us and they bear false witness and they don't even know what they're doing. They don't even realize what's actually going on. But ladies and gentlemen, we have got to be believers who stand strong in the faith and continue to follow Jesus and continue to do our jobs regardless of what the critics may say. Because anybody standing for a cause will be criticized. It doesn't mean you go out and pick fights. It just means that when you're trying to do good things, there's always an enemy that tries to stand against you. And so this leads me to the quote from Mark Madison. He said this, Opposition from the enemy, notice how he capitalized that, is often a good sign. If I say good. He said a vital sign. He said you're on the verge of a breakthrough. In other words, this morning, for some of you sitting here today, the fact that people are coming against you, the fact that people are speaking against you, the fact that there is opposition doesn't always mean that you're going the wrong direction. Sometimes the fact that there is opposition is a clue that you are walking down the right path. So I want to encourage you today, if you're facing opposition, I remember we faced a lot of opposition when we started our church some five years ago. But that wasn't God trying to stop us. That was the enemy trying to stop us. And ladies and gentlemen, when God gets behind the calls, you cannot stop it. And when God gets behind your calls, people can say what they want to say. They can bear false witness against you. But in the end, if you remain firm and you stand and you continue to do good, God will work it out. Amen. Amen. It may take some time. For Joseph, it took a long time. I remember the story of Joseph. Everybody say Joseph. Joseph was a dreamer. I don't know if you know this or not. We are a church that dreams. We're not afraid to dream. We just want to get our dreams from the Lord. We don't want to make up our own dreams. We want to dream the visions that God has for us. That's kind of what's wrong with some of the teaching that we have in certain uh, churches, not necessarily in our city. But we teach everybody to dream and go for whatever you want to go for and be whatever you want to be. But we need to go and say, Lord, what is your dream for my life? Because when, when, when we get behind what God's dream is for our life, it's hard. look, you've heard the phrase, it's hard to stop a train. It would be really cool if, it, if the train made the noise right now. Right? By the way, we sold 45 of the train shirts. That's pretty cool. Nobody's going to know what it means except us. Maybe it'll be a conversation piece. Those of you who are new, the train makes a lot of noise. We're in a metal building. It's a little hollowish. And when it comes through, we stop and pray. But when God gets behind you, you get behind the dream that God has for you. I think we have a lot of people trying to do good, but they're not following the dream that God put in their hearts. I said I was going to be an evangelist and travel around and preach. And the Lord said, no, you're going to plant a church. I tried to do the evangelism thing a time or two, and I realized that this thing about planting a church would not leave my heart. It was God's dream. And you need a dream. And so here's what it says. As for you, you meant evil against me. Remember his brother sold him into slavery. Just about killing. Thank goodness. Thank the Lord for Reuben. And they sell him into slavery. So he winds up in Egypt. He, 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 he works and everywhere he goes he rises and then something happens and he falls. And, and, and he rises up and now he is second in command to Pharaoh and there's a famine in the land and all of a sudden you have Joseph who had to stop and pause and cry and he says, as for you, you meant evil against me but God meant it for good. How many of you know this morning that there are things that people have said and done against you but God can turn it around for our good? He said, God meant it for good to bring, about, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now I know that 
you know, if I was to allow you to text the church number, it's probably on the bulletin. I'll have the church form with me. You probably ask this question today. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. What are other verses describing how serious God is about wine? See, y'all are feeling really good. Now you're like, Pastor, could we just be a short sermon go home today? I'm encouraged. I'm positive. I'm Caleb. I'll listen to Caleb the rest of the day. I'll tip the waitress and the, or the waiter very good. But don't talk about wine, preacher. How many know you've heard it said, no wine church? Y'all ever said that? Heard that before? I walked into a reception yesterday and they were like, oh, goodness. Here comes the pastor. Everybody start acting good. <laughs> and I thought, huh? Anyway. <laughs> Nothing to do with the message. Just let me think about it. Like, you don't lie in church. You don't say bad things around the pastor, right? But y'all, God is everywhere, and I'm not God. I'm just like you. I told you many times, I'm up on a platform because God didn't make me very tall. I pray, uh, when I get to heaven, I'm a little taller. But anyway. But what are some other verses that God uses describing how He feels about lying? Because, y'all, I'm telling you, like, it's not just people lying on us or us lying on others. Like, there's a purpose behind uh, lying. And bearing a false witness is lying about someone else. So, so it, it slides right on in. It's kind of hard to leave it out when you're talking about Bearing a false witness. So here's what some of it says over in Titus 1, uh, I believe 1 12. Here's what it says 1 2, I'm sorry. In the hope of eternal life, which God, I bolded it. What does it say about God? Who does not what, church? Oh, how many are thankful this morning that God doesn't lie? Amen. That you can trust the Word, that you can trust Him, that if He says it, that is, that is the final authority. Nobody can stop it, nobody can overcome it. If God has put something into effect and He has made it a law or if He has created it and it's in His Word, then by golly, it is what it is. Well, here's what some other verses say. Proverbs 21.6. This is where it gets a little scary for us here. It says, The getting of treasures by a lying tongue. I mean, nobody ever climbs the, the corporate ladder by lying to the church. Nobody ever jumps over somebody else's position at work by lying, do they? I mean, that never happens, right? And Christians never lie, right? But it says that it's like a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. In Proverbs 6, 16 and 17, the ESV, it says there are six, and I say six, and notice this, six things the Lord hates. Like if God hates it, that's, that's, not, that's, that's got to be bad. Right, he hates it. You know, we always tell don't hate others. You're not supposed to hate others. Not to hate. When God hates something, I think it's about time that we stop pretending that lying is okay. I'm going to preach old school just for a minute. I'll let you back up before we leave. But can I just tell you, if, look, if God is against something, then Adam should be against it too. If God is against something, then the church should be against it too. If God says that He hates something, then people ought to hate what God hates and ought to love what God loves. says there's six things the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to Him. Holy eyes and a lying tongue. You can go back and read those in court. That's for another series. So He doesn't like it. But why do we do it? Why is it no big deal? Don't raise your hand this morning. How many times a little lie this morning? You make it late to work, and really it's because it's not because the train stops you, even though that is a great true excuse in Mary Arkansas. Anybody, if you've lived here for more than 24 hours. <laughs> I got in my flesh one time and I called the train station, <laughs> told them how much God loved them. <laughs> that's not that, that's a lie. <laughs> But little lies are still lies. And lies, this is not in the long term, they have effects. In the short term, they may help you. But in the long term, what happens is you start lying. And I don't know if you're like me or not, 
But if, you, if you've heard somebody lie about something and you've caught them in a lie, do you just trust everything that comes out of their mouth? When you start lying about little things, you start lying about big things, when you start to lie, people start to distrust you. You, you, you don't have any credit with people anymore when you lie. And God's people need to find a better way than lying. And sometimes what lying does is, is look, you're not necessarily a bad, you know, trying to, trying to be evil, but you sometimes will lie about certain things. This would be real good for you. This is good for me. It's good for everybody. Sometimes we lie and we cheat and we do things out of, outside of God's ideas because we don't trust Him enough to handle it, so we lie about it. I'm about to get bad to costume up in here now. <laughs> but see, we... We don't trust Him enough just to tell the truth on our taxes. Anybody in the church still awake? We don't trust Him enough just to, just to, to do it the right way. I've got to cheat a little. I've got to cut a little. I've got to slide a little. I, 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 I kind of have to control it a little bit because I don't trust God enough just to, just to take care of me. I want to tell you something this morning. You keep doing the right things, the right things will happen. Sometimes it takes a little time. One of the most well-known stories, you've probably heard this, uh, by Mason Lock Williams, also known as Parson, was an Episcopal minister. He also had a little side job. Some of you may know a little bit of history here. But he wrote what some people say is the first edition or the, or the first uh, biography ever written about George Washington. I read one source said it was one of the first. Most of them say it was the first. And he wrote a biography on George Washington. And he shared a story. Now this story didn't come out until the fifth edition of the book, right? Of the biography. But he tells a story about uh, George Washington chopping down a cherry tree. Anybody ever heard this story? Y'all, at least you've stayed awake during that portion of school. I remember learning this as a young man. A young lad. I remember it. And, I, and, and they tell the story of him chopping down this cherry tree and his dad confronts him and, and George Washington, he, depending on which one you read, he'll say, you know, he can't, he can't tell a lie, he cannot tell a lie. And, and his dad uh, welcomes him and he's so thankful that, that he told him the truth and that he just, you know, he forgives him and he hugs him or whatever it is. And he basically says, I cannot tell a lie. And this Episcopalian guy, this minister, used this story to present the character of George Washington. In other words, he was relaying the fact, he's teaching about not lying, but the fact is, more than likely, the story never happened. And so the story about teaching people not to lie could have been fabricated, and it was a lie. Now, y'all, I don't know about you, but that's just messed up. <laughs> you didn't have to make up a story and lie about it in order to teach. But anyway, some people think it really happened, some people don't know. But most people will think that the story was probably fabricated. So I mean, I've never seen a cherry tree, but anyway. Here's, here's a verse for you. John 8, 44. This is what we don't want to be aligned with, okay? It's going on, it says, You are of your father, the devil, Yikes. Glad you didn't open with that one this morning, right? Aren't you glad you put a banner up outside that said that? Like, that'll attract all, that'll attract the whole city and the county. They'll, just, they'll probably have to have a, a, a the news will be here. You just put that on the sign. Sometimes I wonder why they put some stuff on church sign. I'm like, invite some people in so they can understand the tone behind what you're saying. But anyway, it says, You have your father, the devil, and your will is to do the father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth. Because there's no truth in him. So we can agree that we don't believe Satan has any truth in him. God is truth. And God's the author of truth. And anything God says and does has to do with his truth. But it says when he lies. Notice that term lie. If I say lies. When he lies. He speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar. And the father of lies. So when we lie. 
You can say, you can say it lightly and say we're acting like the devil. But we have the father of truth and we have the father of lies. Which father do you look more like? Which one do you look like? Can we stop excusing little bitty lies as if it's, as if it's fine? Can we stop pretending that it's okay? And can we start trusting that God will take care of things? Now I'll say this. You can be a little bit overly... You know some people who give you some information and like, like you could have stopped five minutes ago. Like, I didn't need to know all that. There's a difference between knowing when to shut your mouth and lying. Right? Like, this is going to be bad grammar, but you're going to understand. They some stuff you just shouldn't tell folks. <laughs> right? I'm going to say, they some stuff you shouldn't tell me. Like, I'm not God. You confess it to Him. He's, he's going to take care of it. Right? The church, lying is, is, is it's wrong in God's eyes. It doesn't bring glory and honor to Him. And our goal is to bring glory and praise and honor and represent His name. Amen? Amen. This morning as the worship team comes, I have some application for you today. I mean, you're thankful that we've had this team of Kelby and Rebecca and our worship team. Amen. I think they do a fine job bridging the gap. And we appreciate them taking the time to come and lead for us. This morning, um, you know, sometimes lying is harder for some people to stop doing it up. Some of you are just naturally honest people. Some of you are pretty honest until the pressure gets on you. But I'm going to ask you to do, not for me, but for the Lord, to choose not to be the person spreading lies. Let's not create little thoughts and come up with things that aren't true to make ourselves look better or someone else look worse or whatever the insecurity may cause you to say. If we're not sure, let's keep it to ourselves. And let's not tear down others in order to promote ourselves. Amen to that? Do one to others as you would have to do one. Number two this morning, no matter how nice you are, think about Jesus. Jesus was a strong man. He, he knew when to be gentle. He knew when to bite. If you read through the character of Jesus, sometimes you look at Jesus as if he was just some little weak one. He was not weak. He stood straight up to the elite and he told them exactly what they needed to hear. Jesus had a backbone. He was a man. And we need to get the word out that we serve a powerful God. He's also loving. He's also all these other things. But he is not weak. So no matter how nice you are, there will always be naysayers and enemies who tell lies about you. And so I think if you know going in that humanity is fallen, that we are sinful, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, then you understand that at some point in life, somebody's going to say something about you that's not true. I think it kind of helps you. But here's what I want to say in response to that. Some of you, I, I've mentioned this before, like some of you are very confrontational. What'd you say about me? And the finger gets going. And I see at least one person smiling. Some of you are like, oh, it's not me. Ask your friends, they'll tell you. <laughs> the honest friend. Ask the honest friend. Alright? Here's what we have to do. We need to be prayerful about our reaction when someone does bear false witness against us. Okay? 
Sometimes a response is necessary. I don't know about you. I'm naturally confrontational. Some of you are naturally confrontational. What'd you say? Let's go. Roll them up. <laughs> I mean, right after church, right? <laughs> Talking bad about the Son of the Lord. I'm, I'm God. Woo! Some of us, that's our natural reaction. Right? And listen, Jesus rolled up into the temple one time and he didn't like what was going on. And I don't know that he rolled up his sleeves, if you will, but he rolled in there and he, he, he properly channeled his anger. And there, there's a time for confrontation. But many times I have learned, and some of this I have learned the hard way. I'm not perfect. None of us are. And sometimes we just have to remain silent or wait. But some of us have this need to say, I'm going to say something. Sometimes it's not God, it's our flesh. It's just, just a little too much in the flesh. Going back to you know, my, my, my in-laws and them being in coaching and everything. I don't know how she just sat in the stands and didn't say anything. Like, I, I can let you know right now, it wouldn't happen. My family, they're going to say so. It don't matter which side. You go to the covenant, you go to the blessing, you, you, look, you go to the Kennedy, you say, whatever side, we, we, we're going to say something, right? But church sometimes, you have to let God work it out. And it may not happen as fast as you want it to, but let's not hurt our character by having the wrong response when somebody wrongs us. And I'm telling you, that's hard to do. It's hard to do. So finally this morning, if you'll stand with me. I would just ask you today, you know, we've covered quite a bit about bearing false witness and lying and lies and what they do and what they don't do. But but I would ask you, you know, what are your next steps? And this is where this is a part of the message where you have to kind of internalize things. Don't just think about those across the room or those standing next to you or those at home or somewhere else that need to make this change. Because how many of you have ever said before, boy, they need to hear that message. They should have been here that day. Maybe we need to hear this message today. I'm just going to ask you what your next step is, and maybe that's being aware of the lies that you tell. Maybe that's just confessing them before the Lord and, and repenting and turning from that today. And for some of you, you yeah, look, if you really struggle with it, you might need to print this verse off, and you might need to tape it in your car, you might need to tape it on the mirror. Please, church, don't leave today without allowing the Lord to help you take your personal next step when it comes to the application of this message. I want to pray for you. And it's not just something that we're doing in a service because that's what people do. But I want to really pray for you today. And let's let the Lord do His work. So let's pray. Father, we love you.